Our first speaker under the U.S. experience, a speaker that you've heard already today, is Professor Taras Hunchak from Rutgers University, who I understand has done some work in the whole area of investigating Mr. Ryan, the former investigator of the Office of Investigations of the United States and the Justice Department. Professor Hunchak. Speaking at this juncture reminds me of a truism, namely that the speakers should exhaust the topic, topic and not the audience. <laughs> I think we have been uh, uh, hopefully doing both uh, and not just the latter. Uh, well, uh, investigating the investigator, yes, I wrote something about uh, Mr. Uh, Ryan, but I will not go into that because he wrote that what I would consider an infamous book uh, uh, called The Quiet Neighbor and I in my own way say so. Now uh, just a few words about the uh, proceedings in the United States. Uh, generally speaking the proceedings have not been a very good ones. The, from my perspective, although I was involved only in uh, one case where I uh, was asked to make some depositions and, and uh, talk to both sides, so to speak, advise them, no, actually in two cases now that I think about it. Uh, but I am quite familiar with, with quite a few uh, cases and, and uh, it seems to me that on several levels there were mistakes made. First of all, the conclusion of the agreement with uh, Moscow in which uh, it was uh, at the express wish of Mr. Rudenko and the current uh, chief prosecutor, it was agreed that it won't be necessary for the Soviet Union to send the witnesses uh, to the United States uh, so, so that they could be cross-examined. And that was probably the worst mistake. Uh, hopefully, should it get to that point in Canada, uh, the Canadians uh, will have more brains than the people from the Justice Department who concluded that agreement, Mr. Civiletti, Mr. Ryan, Neil Sher was there, the current uh, Director of Office of Special Investigations. I'm afraid that they were not very thoughtful men. That's point one. Point two, uh, the, much of the trouble developed in the United States from the media, not so much media, the newspapers, trying the people on the streets prior to the court trials. Unfortunately, I have seen something of that already in Canada happening. Uh, when I saw some, some week, a week ago or thereabout, there was a newspaper from, I th maybe even from Toronto, in which a lawyer from Toronto, I think a criminal lawyer, uh, was urging people to boycott, to stage demonstrations in front of people's houses if the moment their names are mentioned. Mind you, a lawyer. Uh, there must be some riots act, I think, even in Canada. <laughs> and uh, uh, frankly, I think should that occur, if I were involved, the first thing I would do, I would take him to court, provided, and we here are uh, told by Mr. Matas that the Canadian uh, court of law is a reliable instrument of justice. So uh, the, the thing I hope that will not happen in, the United, in, in Canada, should it come to that point, is that the people in the press will be somewhat more responsible than the people in the United States. Breaks my heart to say so after all. It's my country, but that's the way it is. Our experience has been an extremely uh, uh, bad one. Uh, then it should not be permitted, uh, there are many things that, that went wrong. Uh, well, it began with the, with the director of uh, OSI, Office of Special in Investigations, because if he permitted himself the luxury of listing in his book Num the people who will be brought to, uh, to uh, uh, will, who's, uh, who will be involved in court proceedings. That already, to my mind, is prejudicing people's case. And for that he should be taken to court. 
you see. So in the, in, as far as, as I am concerned, the United States proceedings were, did not go uh, uh, too well. And I'm discounting, maybe in all cases justice was rendered. Perhaps. I actually am very suspicious. I, I, I'm actually convinced that they, it was not. Uh, there are many reasons why I think it was not. But one of the things is that uh, the witnesses uh, cannot be really, really relied upon. I mean, can you remember anybody, will you, if you look at him uh, or her now, will you remember them or recognize them 40 years from now? Well, try to do that sometimes, uh, you know, meeting people whom you knew 40 years ago, whether you will recognize them. I had an experience like that once in Minneapolis the, at the airport, you see. So uh, for that reason alone, I, I would really, uh, and Mr. Uh, Mehta said that people are dying and therefore perhaps uh, they should be used to testify. I submit that as it was the case in the Valius uh, proceedings in Chicago, where 10 witnesses were brought and they all testified, they saw him kill, murder and all that, and then the man was proven innocent anyway. I hope that the Canadians approach this problem uh, with a little uh, less enthusiasm. Uh, and then another thing, well, I don't, don't misunderstand me, I do wish that whoever is guilty should be brought to trial. And then just one point that I really must make, it seems we are, we are all like a, a bunch of hounds. We are uh, bloodhounds, I perhaps we should say. We are all looking for criminals. I wish we would have as much zeal looking or finding people who were good people. Since I cannot improve upon that, thank you. <laughs> there is only one quality worse than the hardness of the heart, and that is the softness of the head. <laughs> My topic today is relationship of OSI with the KGB, OSI being the Office of Special Investigations, a special unit in our Justice Department that has been set up to investigate Nazi war crimes. And I have a feeling that OSI's operation and relationship with the KGB is not a matter of the heart, it's a matter of the head. To give you an example of how important Soviet evidence is, of the 17 deportation cases pending today in the United States, 13 rely almost solely on Soviet evidence. There are 12 denaturalization cases. All 12 rely on Soviet evidence. Since we're given 20 minutes to speak, I can give you an outline of the problems that we face in relation to so-called Soviet evidence. I call it KGB evidence. In outline form, I would like to state several syllogisms historical, political, moral syllogisms. Then I would like to give you a couple of facts the way OSI sees it, or fiction the way they see it, and facts the way we see it. Then the danger of the cooperation between KGB, which may not be apparent to an average Canadian or average American, and some evidence of the damage that's being done. Then a couple of items for conclusion. I'm going to give you some syllogisms which the historians and our professors could get you together for another 12-hour session, and I'm sure they can prove. But I think in this audience, we will not need to go into too much detail. We all agree that Gestapo is evil. We also must agree, based on history, that Gestapo and the KGB, whatever their initials were during the Second World War, as they changed often for public relations purposes. From Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, they became partners, and they were both equally <coughs> or just as e evil. 
Collaboration with Gestapo is one of the reasons why OSI is operating in the United States and supposedly in the future in Canada. Collaboration with Gestapo was evil. However, since Gestapo and the KGB are the same, or they have the same track record, perhaps KGB has a little bloodier record, the conclusion should be collaboration between KGB and anybody is also evil. Second syllogism, political cases in Soviet Union are exclusive control of the KGB, not their court or justice systems. Victor Krasin, a Soviet Jew who was tried, a dissident, who was tried in Soviet Union, wrote a very good article in the New York Times Magazine, March 18, 1984, called How I Was Broken by the KGB, wherein he describes how the KGB, in a dissident trial, and dissidents in OSI trials are called political or security to state cases, in a political trial, the KGB started a case against him and against other Jewish dissidents. They negotiated the sentence. They negotiated the judgment, the sentence, and the parole. It was simply total control of the KGB. So it is safe to say that political cases in the Soviet Union are controlled by the KGB. OSI cases are considered political. This one of the United States courts, federal courts in Kungis, United States versus Kungis, said so. These are political security cases. Therefore, OSI cooperation with the Soviets is collaboration with the KGB, and therefore it's evil. Third syllogism. Since collaboration with KGB is evil, OSI collaboration is clear, and therefore OSI collaboration with KGB is totally unacceptable to civilized countries, including the United States. <laughs> A couple examples of fact and fiction, uh, fiction uh, in relation to how the so-called Soviet evidence is explained by OSI. Whenever we complain, whether it's to the Bar Association, to the President of the United States, to Congress or to the press that OSI is dealing with the KGB, OSI cleverly responds that they're dealing with the Soviet system of justice, they're dealing with the procurators, they're dealing with the courts, and they never mention KGB. They don't even deny it. They immediately go into the explanation that they're dealing with the judiciary. However, what are the facts? In the Kairis case in Chicago, tried two years ago, it was clearly established from the first day on the KGB did the investigations in Soviet Union. No procurator, no Department of Justice there. It was simply the KGB. This is part of a court record. It has been established by OSI experts because they complain of the fact that all the archives, all the material in the archives belong and are controlled by the KGB. Witnesses, the witnesses that they produce for depositions are in complete and sole protection and custody of the KGB. They decide, they select who's going to be witness. They prepare the witnesses and they control their testimony from the beginning to end. It is very important to note that after almost six years of OSI operations, and they keep explaining to the press, they keep explaining to the bar associations that it's a fair proceeding. In six years, there hasn't been one witness found by the KGB for the defense. There hasn't been a single document that would help a defense. Everything has been produced by the OSI, for the OSI. While OSI is saying that the Soviet system and the court system is what they're dealing with, the KGB came out two years ago with a major article in the Zvestia and later was repeated in Pravda, and they clearly bragged 
how they are in charge and how they're in charge of the whole process of deporting people from the United States. And they also complained that the United States Office of Special Investigations indirectly without naming their friends, they, they called them incompetent and inefficient. Another fiction, any time that OSI is criticized by Congress or by other attorneys or by the press, they keep repeating that they are operating under U.S. federal rules of civil procedure. However, since majority of the materials, majority of the evidence comes from Soviet Union, we have to look as to how it's done over there. All of the information, all the procedure that the KGB uses is according to the USSR criminal procedures. It's a very important distinction. In the United States, it's a civil procedure. Over there, it's a criminal procedure. Under criminal procedure over there, the witnesses and the people that would possibly be witnesses are under completely different uh, protection of the KGB. The records and the previous testimony of the witnesses in Soviet Union is in the hands of the KGB. Some of these witnesses have testified many, many times before. Each time their testimony changes according to which notorious Nazi they're testifying against. We cannot get the records. We, in the United States, we would. In Canada, you would be allowed to get the records. Over there, KGB decides which record, which pre previous testimony we can allude to. The most important criticism, perhaps, of the way the depositions are taken in Soviet Union is the fact that we simply don't have the right for proper cross-examination. I don't care what OSI says, and they keep saying that we have a right to cross-examine, we cannot ask the simplest questions to which we're entitled to. These are called so-called discovery depositions. We have a wide, wide range of questions that we may ask. In fact, what happens when we try to ask questions which may embarrass the witness because he's lying, or try to refresh his memory from his previous testimony, or try to find out how many hours KGB was coaching him in the basement before they brought him up. All these questions are not allowed. The person that sits in judgment as to whether it's allowed or not is not a U.S. court justice. It is the KGB procurator who finally decides which questions may be asked which questions may not be asked. And yet, OSI has the audacity to tell the press, to tell Congress, and perhaps their colleagues in Canada, that they follow the federal rules of cross-examination. We can go on, the list is very long, of the various problems that we have of OSI not following the American procedures. I mentioned just several for, to illustrate. Now, what are the dangers of collaboration with the KGB besides the very obvious danger that the defendant simply does not have means to protect himself against a Gestapo type of an operation? First of all, we must remember that by allowing the KGB openly and notoriously to cooperate with American government, and perhaps in the future with the Canadian government, we allow the KGB PR department to compare itself to our CIA. You know, you were talking about articles in movies. The CIA is always pictured as bad as the KGB. What's the difference? Well, there is a world of difference. But the KGB needs that PR. By bragging and showing that they're doing the work for OSI, they become legitimate in the eyes of the Western world. The same thing is true of Soviet courts. We all know about Soviet courts. Our U.S. Attorney General Smith gave two speeches in 1984 concerning Soviet court system, especially after the attempted assassination of the Pope and of the attempted uh, deception of the free world press with the Ku Klux Klan forgeries in the Olympics. Mr. Smith gave a tremendous 
raging report against the Soviet system, and yet his people are dealing with them, and they're giving credit to the Soviet system, court system. Second major category of interest, or the danger of collaboration with KGB, is the fact that they're given a chance to rewrite history. It is pretty clear from our cases in the United States that it is the KGB which determines which defendants will be tried in the United States. It's unfortunate, but they send the package over from USSR embassy to OSI, and OSI immediately follows up like a good, honest assistant. Selection of documents and witnesses, I mentioned before, is done solely by the KGB, and they can, only, they can select the documents which they wish so they can turn history to their liking. After listening to the so-called experts on Soviet law, and I mean, sorry, on Nazi history, and on Lithuania in one court case in Florida, the judge said, and I'm not quoting him, I'm paraphrasing him, that Nazis and Gestapo came to, to Lithuania to save the, the Jews from persecution because Lithuanians were persecuting them, and the Nazis came to save them. This is history according to KGB, and they were able to do that in a U.S. court. There is evidence that this damage is being felt in various areas. First of all, it is very important for KGB to demoralize its dissidents, refuseniks, the people who are against the system, either because they want freedom for their countries, because they want freedom to worship, or because they simply want to get out, like most Jewish refuseniks. By sending people to <coughs> USSR, and we have done that already to one Ukrainian, Fedorenko, by using their so-called court system, by cooperating with their KGB open and notoriously, we give the message to the dissidents that we respect the system that convicted them. And this is a big plus for the KGB. Furthermore, Soviet Union has a major internal problem. The Ukrainian dissidents, the Lithuanian dissidents, our underground publications, the Jewish dissidents, their publications, the Christians, all of them are a problem. By splitting our community, some of the things that we're discussing today, by putting Jew against Ukrainian, Christian against Jew, they are achieving, they're trying to split something they could not do in Soviet Union. Because the dissidents in gulags are not split by religion or nationality. They are united. KGB found a method by using Canadian and American dollars, I hope not Canadian dollars, but they're using many millions of American dollars to achieve their goals. Secondly, by giving false evidence, by giving selected documents or forged documents, and it's very difficult to find out which are forged, they are using American courts to cover up for the Red Terror. It is a problem for them to tell their students, their young people, what happened and what happened to 23 million Soviet people during Stalin days. Well, it's much easier to attack Hitler, but it's much easier to attack the Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, and others because they don't have to talk about what they did to our populations. It also is a, a shame, but with this cordial and friendly relationship. One judge called them brothers, another called them partners, that is OSI and KGB. They have in fact infiltrated our judicial system. In conclusion, I would like to say that the Soviet court system and their investigators, the KGB, are simply corrupt. They are totally unacceptable to Americans and to Canadians. KGB produced evidence. I don't care how much we rationalize it. It is their evidence. It is not only unacceptable, 
It is morally wrong. It is politically damaging. And as three courts in the United States have found, they're completely unacceptable in U.S. courts. And I would like to quote from one case, which is the appellate court decision in Leipnix. And, and I quote, the prosecution of the case resulted from unusual cooperation effort of OSI and Soviet authorities. And then the court speaks, goes on to speak the difficulties with Soviet involvement in these cases. And this is a federal appellate court. Soviet authorities are outside of the ju jurisdiction of the United States judicial system. Consequently, it is impossible to provide the usual safeguards of trustworthiness of evidence having its source in Soviet Union. This becomes a matter of concern for two reasons. First, the Soviet authorities have a strong motive to ensure that the government succeeds in its cases. KGB has a 100% record for that. Second, Soviet criminal and judicial system is structured to tailor evidence and to produce results which will further the important political ends of the Soviet state at the expense, if needed, of justice in a particular case. The motive, this court alluded to, is the desire of the current Soviet government to discredit, em to discredit emigres who fled fled Eastern Europe in face of the impending Soviet advancement towards the end of Second World War. If, in fact, what I said in the syllogisms, the cooperation with the KGB is evil, then it damages all of us. It damages Christians, it damages Jews, it damages Americans, it damages Canadian, and it becomes a cancer in our judicial system. And I would like to quote from our colleague, Mr. David Mattis, in his book that he referred to, where he states, if we bend the law for a particular purpose, we establish a dangerous precedent. We weaken our moral position and dilute the impact of the moral point we wish to make that what the Nazi war criminals did was wrong. I agree with that 100 percent, and I think you should be more careful in Canada than we were in the United States. Now we have a cancer. You just have a cold. Good luck.